Welcome, everyone. Uh, we appreciate all of you joining us for our November webinar on treatment and modality options for kidney patients. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of reminders. Your phones are muted. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box or save them until the end of the program, and you can ask them um, when it gets to the question and answer time by unmuting your phone uh, by hitting pound six. And you will receive a copy of the link to the recording and the slides by email. And at the end of the program, there is a feedback form, and we appreciate your giving us um, feedback as well as suggestions on other programs that you would like to see. Today we're going to talk about. First floor, DuPont, Middle Ground, please report to room 116. First floor, DuPont building. Okay, somebody's phone uh, or, or computer is not on mute. If everybody could uh, make sure that you're on mute by making sure that you do star six, that would be helpful. Um, today we're going to learn more about kidney disease and what treatment is available when our kidneys stop working. And today we have the president of our DPC Education Center Board of Directors, Nancy Scott, with us. And she's going to introduce our speaker, Joanne Smith. Nancy? Thank you, Kathy. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, it, it, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Joanne Smith. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Joanne in 2004 when I went on dialysis. She was my clinical manager. And believe me, I was a handful, but she was very patient with me and taught me a lot. Um, Joanne has been a dialysis nurse for 25 years. Uh, 15 years in-center, eight years home dialysis, and for the last two years, she her position is kidney care advocate, health policy rep for Delaware, and I'm sure she'll tell you a, a little bit about what she does now. Joanne also received a very prestigious award from ANNA. Um, she was um, il um, appointed and voted for this position, and she has received several prestigious awards, but I'm sure that's one that she'll never forget. And also, for those of you that have been with us for a while, Joanne was also our Director of Education for the Dialysis Patient Center Education Center. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce Joanne Smith. Thank you, Nancy. That was very kind. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, I look forward to uh, presenting. Uh, so I, I actually do this education pretty much on a daily basis. I meet with people with CKD and also end-stage renal disease, people that are already in the clinic, to talk about the different treatment options. Because unfortunately, even though people have started dialysis, um, a lot of the time they actually have no idea that there are other options available. So um, I cannot forward the slides, so somebody on the inside will be doing that because I am IT illiterate. And uh, so if we want to move on to the first slide, please. OK, so the objective for today's um, presentation is certainly to, ra to uh, raise awareness of the understanding of kidney disease and all the options available. Um, also, to empower people to be able to make decisions on their own based on education, right? So you've heard Nancy Scott many, many times say, you know, um, um, education is empowerment, right? And so the more you know, uh, the better off you are to be able to make uh, an educated decision on what it is that you want, you want to be happening in, in your life. Um, so what's real important about treat, the, the treatment options um, that I provide is, is to first of all acknowledge or kind of assess what people are going through, right? So I meet people at different stages, right? So I meet people who have no idea that they even have kidney disease. And I also meet people that know that they've had kidney disease for years. Um, so kind of first of all assessing where they are. And, and how they're able to, um, you know, understand or, or embrace 
um, what's going on in their lives. Um, you know, in particular, I like to talk about um, how to slow down the progression of kidney disease, um, how the kidneys work, you know, how to keep your body healthy, how to preserve whatever function you have left, right? Um, so it's really, really important for people that have kidney disease to actually know what percentage of kidney function they're working with. Um, and that's actually called the GFR, or the Marial Filtration Rate. And that's, that's an actual percentage number. And unfortunately, a lot of people will say, I think I'm stage four, I think I'm stage three. But real important to know, even though they know what stage they are, I mean, so I'll just give you a rundown. So stage one would be a GFR of anywhere between 120 and 90%. Stage two would be 89% to 60%. Stage three would be 59 to 30%. Stage four would be 29 to 15%. And then when you hit stage five, anything less than 15% kidney function or EGFR is considered stage five. So really important that, that people know their numbers and, you know, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? What can they do to make things different or, or, or to at least keep them stable, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the dialysis options, right? We're going to talk about hemodialysis. Hemo meaning blood, um, and with hemodialysis, there's actually two different options. There's the in-center option, and there's also home options, right? They both uh, require a vascular access present and able to um, perform that procedure either way. There's also peritoneal dialysis, or we say PD, um, and there's also two ways to do PD. CAPD is continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. And that's done manually with, without a machine, typically four times a day, spread throughout the day. Then there's CCPD, and that's continuous, and that's actually done, for the most part, overnight while people sleep. So for, uh, typically, peritoneal dialysis is done seven days or nights per week. But I'm actually now starting to hear um, more progressive docs are kind of you know, rethinking, you know, based on lab results. Um, and we actually have a bunch of people that are doing five days. Certainly we don't want them doing, um, having back-to-back -back days off. In other words, we don't want them taking the weekend off, you know, running Monday through Friday and then having off Saturday, Sunday. We would actually prefer that they take off, you know, maybe run Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, off Thursday, run Friday, Saturday, off Sunday. You know, we don't want those toxins and build it, um, fluids building up especially with PD, because PD is a very, very slow and gentle process. Um, so really, gr really great to hear, I feel, um, for, and, you know, benefit of the patients that, you know, the docs are really taking a good look at lab results and, and, and kind of decreasing, if possible, um, the number of times that people are doing dialysis at home. So um, also, uh, I get involved with dietary and social work, and I work with a financial coordinator to help people understand, you know, how, how all these how these all come together. Like dietary is very, very important. Um, although there's not a diet that will cure, there's actually nothing that will cure uh, kidney disease, but dietary um, information is, is so important. You know, it can really make a huge difference, even with people currently on dialysis, on how their dialysis treatment goes and how they feel. Right? And then social work, you know, you think, um, you know, what do you need a social worker for? Social workers do uh, an abundance of, of tasks, right? Everything from transportation issues, insurance issues. Um, you know, we have our social workers help us with, with psychosocial issues. Um, as far as, you know, for home patients, we do home visits. And, and uh, you know, sometimes patients get into situations where they're not in the best home environment. The social worker can actually come in and provide um, some resources to help them clean up or, or move out or whatever whatever needs to happen. And then for the financial coordinator, I am a nurse, so I don't by any means try and pretend that I know the finances. I know a little bit about Medicare and how that how that works for um, dialysis patients, but I certainly always refer, and it's a one-on-one -on -one private conversation, um, and it's all voluntary. Um, but it's really important, but it, and it, it and just puts all the pieces together. It's uh, very important that it's all included. Um, so I'm going to get in more detail. So in-centered hemodialysis, um, so that is a, a hemodialysis is a dialysis done typically three times a week. 
usually for four hours each session. Um, it's done Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Some areas are um, fortunate enough to provide a nocturnal shift as well, which would be um, an eight-hour shift. And that may be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and that's just depending on the clinic. So what you want to remember is that when your kidneys were functioning, they function 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, sometimes I get some kickback from, from, from people that I speak with saying four hours seems like a long time. But really, if you're thinking about in-center dialysis, in four hours' time, we're actually trying to provide the same amount of fluid and toxin removal as in 48 or sometimes even 72 hours worth of when your kidneys are functioning properly. So if you take that into consideration, four hours is very minimal, right? And that's why, you know, there are some uh, symptoms that sometimes come with that type of dialysis. But the advantages of doing in-center dialysis are you come to a clinic, you're actually getting very comfortable, you have the same people there, you're the same staff, you have staff taking care of you, um, you're able to um, be in a situation with other people, kind of like a, a kind of a mini support group where, you know, people going through what you're going through are there and they can understand what you're going through. As a medical professional, um, even 25 years in, I, uh, I, I make it crystal clear to people that I have no idea what it feels like to have kidney failure. Um, you know, I know all the treatments and, and the diet and everything else, but um, really being with other people um, that are, you know, going through the same process um, makes a huge difference for some people. Um, so with in-center, it's three days per week. That means you have four days off. Um, with those four days off, there come dietary and fluid restrictions. Um, but there is no equipment at your home. Um, and then medical help is available right there, right? So you have medical staff right there. They're constantly monitoring you throughout your treatment. So they're available. Um, and, and it makes a lot of people very comfortable that they have medical staff right there. Um, that's actually one of the um, one of the concerns I hear for people that are considering home dialysis. What if, you know, and will I be able to take care of myself if, if an emergency occurs? Some of the disadvantages to in-center dialysis are that is the travel. In particular, so I live in Delaware, and I know that it's very difficult. Um, you know, we rely on a, on a transport system that is. Um, I guess as reliable as they can be, but it, it's a long, long day for people. So typically they're picked up about an hour at least before their, their appointment time for their dialysis. They get to the clinic, they sit there and wait. People go in, they have their treatment for the four hours, then after the bleeding stops, they come out. The transportation's usually not there immediately, but you know, within hopefully a half hour to another hour. And then they may have to stop at several places before they actually get home. So it kind of ends up being a pretty long day for people, and that's pretty tough uh, for a lot of people after a dialysis treatment to be riding around on, on a bus or, or in transportation. Um, you do need a permanent access. And so when we talk about a permanent access for hemodialysis, um, that could be uh, the, the number one um, type of access that we uh, encourage people to get is called a fistula. So a fistula is actually an artery and a vein surgically connected. Uh, usually takes about four to six weeks for that to heal up. Um, and then after that time, um, you know, we're able to put two needles in to provide the, the dialysis. Um, we also have what's called a graft. And, and usually people that have tiny veins um, end up with uh, what we call a graft. And that's actually a piece of, of soft tubing. Uh, used to be Gore-Tex tubing, um, but they have a variety of materials now. But it does the same thing, right? So it's connected to an artery and vein, and that usually takes about, uh, I'd say about four to five weeks for that to heal up before we can use that as well. Um, and basically what happens is you go for a procedure called vein mapping. So you go to the vascular surgeon, he kind of looks you over to see where the best artery and vein connection would be, and then that's where they go for it. They try and do the non-dominant arm, just and just, um, you know, because they don't want you really utilizing that arm for a lot of heavy lifting once that access is placed. Um, unfortunately, there's also something, or fortunately, I guess, called a hemodialysis catheter. Um, we, the dialysis field, kind of feel like the dialysis catheter, that's a last resort. 
Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people start their dialysis with that catheter because they are unprepared. So they don't come, you know, I schedule people for education. Um, and I think it's mostly out of fear of the unknown that they don't want to come and be educated. A lot of people feel denied, you know, that if they don't hear about it, it's not going to happen. Um, but what ends up happening is people get sick, they land in the hospital, they wake up and they have a, a catheter, uh, which is a piece of tubing. It's placed in the neck, chest, or groin, and it should be temporary while we're waiting for a graft or fistula to heal. Um, they have a very high rate of infection. They tend to clot off. And certainly you cannot shower uh, with that catheter in. Um, just, just a little bit of uh, history for uh, what signs of an infection and, and, and what, what grounds for infection are. So in order for an, an infection to occur, um, typically it's a warm, moist, dark area. So when you get that catheter placed in your chest, your body's warm, and we put a, a dressing on it to protect it, but it makes it dark now, and then people will shower, and now it's wet. So it really leads to very high infection rates. And, and you don't really, you know, you, people that know what a catheter is, you don't really get a lot of blood flow through a catheter. You get a lot of uh, recirculation of the blood. So in order to do hemodialysis, best bet is to have your fistula or graft placed and placed early, right? So if we have people on the line that have kidney disease but not yet, you know, they're, or they're heading towards um, probably needing dialysis, even if you're a year off, I still say get that fistula, talk to your nephrologist, but, you know, get that schedule and get that fistula placed. Think of it like as an insurance policy. I even talk to people that are thinking transplant. They definitely have a living donor lined up, and that's the way they're going to go. But you never know, right? So there's pros and cons with, with transplant. So I encourage people, have that fistula placed. And if you never need it, it's an artery and vein, and it, it, it's sitting there. And if for whatever reason you need to use it, it'll be used. Um, but anyway, that's my bandwagon on the, on the uh, fistula. But um, so also, so with hemodialysis, because it is only four hours, three times a week, sometimes people, um, you know, get some discomfort during the treatment, like headaches, uh, nausea. They get some cramping. Um, and then typically after the treatment, they're pretty washed out because what you have to imagine is your body goes from a, uh, uh, you know, a high volume of fluid and toxins, and then four short hours we pull off pretty much what we can, and so your kind of throws your body off balance. So a lot of times people need to go home, take a nap, they feel much better afterwards, but their body needs a little bit of time to compensate for that, that procedure. And also, there is restricted fluid and diet with uh, hemodialysis. So when we talk about restricted fluid, you, we usually tell people about a quart of fluid a day. We actually encourage them to measure. Um, we also talk about fluids that are contained in food, right? So we have people all the time, they come in, they get up on the scale, and they say, I did not drink anything at all since my last treatment. And undoubtedly, they have about four or five kilos of fluid on and it's a result of fluid contained in foods or any kind of foods that will melt down the fluid at room temperature. Um, so real important to kind of remember those things um, when restricting your fluid. Oops. Okay. So our next uh, type of dialysis we're going to talk about is peritoneal dialysis. So what you need to know is that in your lower abdomen, there is a membrane. It's called a peritoneal membrane. And right now, it's just used um, for, you know, kind of protecting all the organs and vasculature down in that lower abdomen area. But it was found out years ago that the peritoneum can be used as a filter. So what we do is we have a dialysis solution that is sterile. It contains some dextrose. And um, by use of a peritoneal dialysis catheter, which is a, a rubber piece of tubing that is permanently um, inserted by a surgeon. It's an outpatient procedure, um, and it's placed in the pelvic region. Um, it extends out of the abdomen for about 12 inches. Um, we have different belts where we can help you tape that up and out of the way. But what we do is teach people to connect tubing thoroughly, and, and, and it's a procedure that the nurse will show you. Um, and, the, and the solution actually is instilled into the peritoneal area um, for a prescribed time. So um, in CAPD, which is the manual type of PD, 
most people have a, what we call a dwell of that fluid for about four, four to six hours. And then after four to six hours, they will drain out that fluid. Um, it's a whole system that we have. It's a drain bag and a fill bag connected. They drain out that system. It takes usually about, I tell people, about 10 minutes to drain. And then they refill with another uh, five pounds or so of the sterile solution. So they're constantly having that sterile solution dwelling in their abdomen. And they're actually constantly getting dialysis um, very gently and very slowly, um, but they're constantly getting dialysis. Now, some people will say, you know, can I ever be empty or not have fluid in my belly? And certainly we do have situations where people are empty during the day. Um, we have people that are runners or they play sports, or, and we actually teach them to empty out um, and then do whatever exercise or whatever it is they're going to do, and then to go ahead and, and do an exchange and put fluid in. But it's a very, very gentle type of dialysis. Um, it uses your own body parts, right? So it doesn't use... In hemodialysis, I failed to mention, there is what we call a dialyzer or an artificial kidney. And that is a synthetic membrane um, that has solution. It is biocompatible for your body, but it is still a, a foreign substance. So it's a, it, it's a synthetic uh, membranous tube. Um, but with peritoneal dialysis, you're actually using your own body part, right? So how, more, how much more natural other than your, other than your kidney can you get? So with CAPD, the exchanges are done manually. You don't need a machine. Um, and actually, even if people are on the machine, we teach them to do manual exchanges in case they have a power failure and don't have a generator. So they always have that back up. Um, so no machine is needed for CAPD. It's usually four exchanges done during the day, spread out. Um, PD is seven days a week, though, unless it's prescribed any less by the physician. Like I said, it's a very gentle type of dialysis. but no partner is needed, so that's a big plus for a lot of people. We have a lot of elderly people that are on PD <clears throat> that are widow widowers, and they, um, they are doing fabulous. They, they don't need the partner. It's very doable. It's an easy procedure. And um, most people do get trained in CAPD first just so they have the concept of the different strengths of solution, of what's sterile, what's clean, what's dirty, you know, and, and the whole process. It is very, very easy to travel with CAPD for the most part. Um, we tell people, uh, you know, if you're going to go away for several weeks, what you'll do is the people that you order supplies through, you'll let them know where you're going, how long you'll be there, and they'll ship the supplies right there for you. Um, we tell people, though, to carry uh, one or two boxes with them just in case, but honestly, we really, knock on wood, have not had a problem with uh, people having traveling with their solutions. And then some people, if they're taking short trips, they'll just throw a couple boxes in the car. They bring some uh, box of masks with them, some waterless hand sanitizer, and they are pretty good to go. Um, for CCPD or continuous PD, so that's actually done with a machine, and it's done overnight. Usually there are five exchanges that occur with the machine. Um, the first thing the machine will do is uh, drain you out. And then it fills you up. It'll sit there for about an hour to two hours, depending on how well your peritoneal membrane processes the solution. It's usually eight hours, um, and it is seven nights a week. Um, I know that the screen says eight to ten hours. Ten hours seems like an awful long time for someone to be on a machine. I mean, if you sleep ten hours, awesome, do it. But what I do is there are different settings on the machine. For example, we do what's called a pause. So if somebody requires more than eight hours, usually I'll set, tell them, set the machine up early. So you can set the machine up 12 hours ahead of time and let it sit there. But you can set the machine up. And I tell them, you know, around maybe around in the afternoon sometime. Get on the machine, attach to the machine. It'll drain you out and it'll fill you up. And then you can come off. So there's different pieces um, that you, it's something called a multi-tubing segment that you can add to your tubing um, so that when you go back on, you're going to use a piece, a fresh piece of tubing. So we never reuse anything, nothing, in, in peritoneal dialysis. So we even have drain lines and then extension drain lines. So for the machine that you see here, we have a 20-foot drain line, um, which is usually suitable if your bathroom is within your bedroom. We usually can get that tubing to reach your toilet, and we have a setup where we can connect it right to the toilet or the tub. Um, uh, sometimes, though, people need to use extension sets, so they have the 20-foot, 
and they may add a 10-foot extension to that, but you're constantly doing, you know, throwing your supplies away when you're done using them. Also, if you contaminate supplies, you're throwing them away. So the, the biggest risk for peritoneal dialysis and the biggest fear for people with PD is um, infection. So we review every possible risk for infection and what you're going to do to avoid that infection. And one of the big pieces is if you think you contaminated something, throw it out. We give you enough supplies that if you contaminate, there's no reason why you should not be able to um, get, some, get a new piece for whatever it is that you think you contaminated. We also have on-call nurses um, in most areas, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have any question at all, she's going to call the nurse and run it by her. A lot of times if people think they contaminated, the nurse will say, okay, so you're not going to do your treatment tonight. You'll come in tomorrow. We'll send out a sample of your drain fluid and then maybe do a manual exchange or two, and then you'll get back on the cycler at night. Um, the cycler is a very, very easy to use. It's a touch screen. Um, great to travel with. We give people a rolling suitcase. And then same thing with the supplies. If you go somewhere, the su supplies will be shipped ahead. Um, and you just bring your cycler with you if you want. Um, and then there's also a memory stick that goes into the computer. And now we have what's called a patient portal as well. Um, so all that information is sent directly to the nurses. And they review that every morning to see, to make sure that you pulled off enough fluid or if there were alarms or whatever problems there were. And then the nurse is able to call and say, hey, you know, saw on your treatment last night that you may not have ultrafiltrated enough fluid. You know, um, and then we talk about blood sugars and what reasons um, that that may be, that that, how that happened. So the advantages and disadvantages for PD. So the advantages, it's um, definitely, uh, you know, so it, you have control over your schedule. Definitely a more liberal diet. So compared to in-center where we tell people that they have to really closely watch their potassium foods, so that's tomatoes, bananas, oranges, greens, those type of foods, people that do PD can eat those, those uh, potassium foods, right, because they're getting dialysis every single day. They're only required to come to the clinic twice a month. They come one time for us to draw a lab, and the second time they'll come, they'll see the dietitian, the social worker, the nephrologist, and the nurse. Um, they have a more stable lab result, right? So they're constantly dialyzing. So their labs, unlike in-center, their labs are not going, you know, raising up and, and decreasing. So their labs are pretty stable. There's no needles, um, except for when you have the labs, of course. Um, you have the freedom to travel pretty much anywhere in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, and also it preserves your blood vessels, right? So. Um, if, and if you, people decide that PD is not for them and they want to move over to HHD or home hemo or hemo in center, um, we encourage them to have a fistula place but continue PD, you know, while they're healing up so they can start with a permanent access, a vas um, vascular access. Some of the disadvantages people talk about, um, if it's manual, they say it kind of ties up their whole day. But I encourage people, you know, we don't tell people that it's an 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock regimen, right? We tell people you get up in the morning, you get yourself ready, set up your breakfast, set up your exchange if you're going to do manuals, and then you put your mask on and wash your hands to do your connection. Once you're connected, that mask can come off. You can sit there and eat your breakfast. You can drain out, fill up. Then when you're done your breakfast, pop that mask back on, use your waterless hand sanitizer, and disconnect. You know, and then for your next exchange, it's four to six hours later. But if you happen to be out somewhere, we don't want you to say, oh, i got to go home to do my exchange. What we say is when you get home, you'll do an exchange. You know, so it, it pretty much is around your schedule and works around your lifestyle. Um, some, another disadvantage of PD is that the solution does contain glucose. So we encourage diabetics, of course, to keep their blood sugar under control so they can use the weakest strength solution to, to make the dialysis happen. If they need stronger strength solutions, what ends up happening is that's a lot more dextrose or sugar, so they do start gaining some weight. So we kind of discourage that. Um, but if they need to use a higher strength solution, if they have some extra fluid on, that is, that's how they get rid of that fluid. You do have to have some space in the home to store supplies. For the most part, I tell people a walk-in closet 
is plenty of space. Uh, but if you really want to do dialysis at home, we, I actually have a, lady, a young lady that lives with her family in a trailer, and she um, stores her supplies under her bed, in her closet, wherever she can, and she gets an every two-week delivery versus a monthly delivery. And then um, lastly, with the, with the catheter um, coming out of the abdomen, some, some people have body image um, that, you know, changes, and, you know, and with the solution, maybe you might gain a little bit of fluid carrying around that five pounds of fluid. Um, some, so some people um, you know, kind of feel self-conscious about that. Um, but I, I think once they um, discover all the benefits of PD, that kind of stuff goes away. Uh, we can do what's called a pre-sternal catheter. So people that like going in hot tubs, you know, we don't really encourage that with a PD catheter in the abdomen. But we can um, request that a pre-sternal or a catheter much higher, um, up like below the breastbone, um, have that place. And then they can, uh, you know, do the, do the hot tub thing as well. So when we talk about hemodialysis, Right, so that's dialysis done at home. Hemodialysis is very similar to what we do in the clinic, but more frequency, right? So constantly we're talking about the, the more frequency of dialysis being much healthier for the body. There's actually several ways to do hemodialysis at home. There's the conventional machine, which very, looks very similar to what you see in the clinic. So it's a big machine. It's used uh, with an RO, a reverse osmosis machine. It uses uh, a water supply and drains and electricity. Um, but it is a bigger machine, and most people use that at home three times a week. So they're not getting more frequent dialysis, but it is in the comfort of their own home. It usually takes most people any type of home hemo. For, for about six weeks of training, we, we bring people to the clinic, usually five weeks of training, and then the last week of training we train in home so people are comfortable in their home environment. Um, there is nocturnal hemodialysis as well, and that's done usually overnight for eight hours, um, either with a conventional machine or a, a, a short daily machine. Um, for the short daily machine, you can see in that slide, if you're looking at the same slide, oh yeah, um, that's our next stage machine, and so that is an awesome, awesome machine. I, of course, uh, as a, a, a dialysis nurse, was very nervous about it at first, but it is, it is just wonderful. I mean, you just open the front of that machine, you slide in a cassette, you make a few connections with your saline line and your drain line, and the machine primes itself, it checks itself out, and then pretty much you do some testing, and after that you're ready to use it. Um, but it, it actually comes on a base that uh, makes water, it, so it makes the water for the dialysate, and so you're making that, it takes about seven hours, but so you just make a connection, put the stack in there, and um, that water is created, and then you test the water before you use it. And some people, most people use it for two treatments and then have to make another sack, but it's, it's pretty awesome, really. I mean, it's a little bit overwhelming when you first look at it, but the nurses teach a step-by-step -step procedure and process for using this machine, and we actually now have an iPad. You can see that gentleman's holding an iPad, and it's connected to the uh, machine, so it monitors the machine, the blood pressure, everything goes through that, and then it's sent to the nurses. So it's a pretty cool setup, and uh, people that are doing it, they, they really, um, I didn't think we'd be able to get people to use iPads just because I'm not that great at it, but they, they do it, they enjoy it, um, because pr prior to the iPad, we had people documenting, so a lot of written documentation that actually was not happening um, as much as we wanted it to. So this is a, a great answer for the documentation piece and for the, the communication between the nurse and the patient as well. Um, there also is a staff assist program, um, primarily uh, for people starting dialysis, and if your, uh, your um, insurance pays for that, it's a staff assist program where your insurance will pay for somebody to come out um, and do your dialysis for you. But that's only for a limited period of time. I believe it's for 30 months. And after 30 months, at that point, you'll have to make the decision to either go in center or to uh, be trained on how to do that dialysis yourself. Um, okay. So, so home hemodialysis, it gives you a lot of uh, control about when you want to do your dialysis. I say for the frequent dialysis, so for the next stage people, they're usually on that machine depending on their size. 
anywhere from two and a half to three and a half or four hours uh, per treatment, and also depending on the number of treatments. So in other words, I have one gentleman that does six days a week, and he does two and a half hours. Um, I have another gentleman that does four days a week, and he does three and a half hours. So, you know, it's all based on time and length of treatment, but it's very flexible. So, you know, if you come home in the evening and you want to jump on that machine, you know, have it set up and ready to go for your two and a half, three hours, you do it. You want to do it first thing in the morning. So it's really same thing, right? Around your schedule, what works best for you. Um, people are seeing improved blood pressure control, less medication, better fluid management, right? Because you're pulling the same thing, right? You're pulling that fluid off more frequently. It's not building up for two or three days. Um, the slide does say that it requires a partner, but the FDA actually approved last year that um, people can do home hemodialysis on their own. So our nephrologists have a protocol and a, a set of criteria. Um, basically, you know, if you can do everything sitting, if you have a stable treatment, you know, um, you know that you're able to do that type of dialysis at home. Me as a dialysis nurse, I'm not digging that, but that's my own fears. Um, but we do actually have a lot of people that do it, and they're very successful. So what you have to remember, though, when you're doing hemodialysis at home, you're doing it more frequently. So you're not having the cramping. Usually you're not having the low blood pressure. You know, you're not feeling washed out because it's pretty, you know, almost daily that you're doing this dialysis. It's, a, it's not similar to what we see in the clinic, but it makes me a little nervous anyway. Anyway, um, so um, the dialysis companies will actually pay uh, for the conventional machine to be installed in your home one time. Um, if you decide um, after that installation that you want to move the machine, that cost would be on you for, for bringing in a plumber and, and, having that and having the machine moved and the electric. Um, but with hemodialysis, we teach people to draw their own labs, and they can either drop them off or mail them in. So honestly, they come into the clinic once a month. You know, so it's, uh, you know, as far as that's concerned, that's very convenient for them as well. All right, so now I'm going to move on to transplant. So transplant, uh, we consider that the golden option, but it is an option, right? It comes with risks and benefits, just like any other option. Um, and those benefits and risks need to be considered. Um, but what a, a kidney transplant takes a healthy kidney from another person, either deceased or alive, and that kidney goes into your body, usually goes in the front of your abdomen, doesn't go in the back. They usually do not take the old kidneys out. Um, some cases they do. I mean, we've had several patients with polycystic kidney disease that actually their kidneys are, were like 25 pounds each, and so they really had no room. And so after the successful transplant, they went back several months later and removed the um, native kidneys. Um, so on the transplant, depending on where you live, transplant list, uh, deceased donor list could be anywhere from two to 10 years. I know for Delaware, we tell people, depending on their blood type, it's probably seven to 10 years for deceased donor. Um, so everyone is not a candidate for a transplant. Certainly, you have to be very healthy. Um, you know, you can't have a lot of heart disease and a lot of cardiac issues. Um, and receive a transplant. So you have to be, you have to undergo uh, an evaluation that's pretty extensive to make sure that there are no cancers, that you don't have cardiac problems, you know, and that you're healthy enough that the risk benefit, um, you know, the risk associated with major surgery are, are, uh, are less, right? So, and there's also risk of re rejection. Um, so you have to take your medications every day at the same time every day. Um, in order to keep that kidney uh, from rejecting. Um, and also we tell people, you know, so with, with, an, um, with a transplant, the way the kidney stays in you and is able to continue to work in you is that your immune system has to be pretty much wiped out. So we tell people, you know, you really want to stay away from people that are sick and certainly you want to do anything you can to avoid any type of infection. There is a lot of follow-up initially with a kidney transplant. Most people are in the hospital for about four days or so, and then even that same week they're back having their blood labs drawn to make sure that there is no signs of rejection. Um, so it is an option. It's a, uh, like I said, it's a great option. Um, I like to talk about living donation as well. I encourage people to um, seek out people that may be interested, and um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You don't have to ask 
somebody for a, for a kidney. I mean, in my area alone, we have a gentleman I'm thinking about in particular. He's an electrician, and he went to the um, he was a PD he was an in center patient, went to PD and gained up some weight, and then went on to home chemo, lost that weight, and then actually uh, put on the billboard of, of his union hall uh, his name, his uh, his age, father of three, looking for an O negative kidney, and then the phone number for the transplant center. Um, it was kind of in a major intersection. He had, within two months, he had 15 random strangers call and offer, and two of them were matches, and he ended up getting a kidney out of that. Um, you know, it's how you encourage people. Put it on a T-shirt. Put it on the back of your car looking for a kidney. And, you know, you're not putting your personal cell phone number, but what you are doing is, is getting the, uh, you know, once you're listed, once you're on the transplant list, getting that transplant phone number and that contact information out to people. Put it on Facebook, put it on anything you, you need to, you know, get, get, just get it out there. Um, I personally donated a kidney to somebody four and a half years ago. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I do this education all the time and I tell people, you know, about living donation and I think, well, I'm, I'm hoping this is really valid information. Uh, but standing in line for communion, I put it in my head, a particular patient, not, not a great friend. Uh, if I would have given one to my friend Nancy, I, that would have been awesome. But anyway, she had a bit already been transplanted at this point. But um, the gentleman's name, you know, God put this guy's name in my head. I went and got tested and didn't say anything to him until um, I was sure it was going to happen because he has had, you know, multiple people tested. And for one reason or another, it didn't work out. But Actually, it was a perfect match, and he and he now takes two meds a day, twice a day. He is healthy. He was on dialysis for, I think he was on it for seven years. But same thing with him. So he was diagnosed with kidney cancer in his 50s, uh, had to start uh, dialysis right away because the options were, you know, we can take your kidney out and you won't have cancer anymore. But unfortunately, he was born with one kidney and never knew it. So he ended up on in-center dialysis with a catheter. Uh, one of the nurses spotted him in here. We brought him in. He started peritoneal dialysis. Had some complications such as hernia, infection, that type of thing. Went on to home hemo, um, and but now he's transferred at four and a half years. So pretty awesome, you know. But there are ways, and I just like to throw it out there. At the end of this um, presentation, my name and my personal cell phone number will be up there. And if anybody for any reason needs or wants to kind of run some ideas by me or if you have some good ideas for me, or if you have some questions, please don't hesitate. Um, this has actually become my whole life. I'm a, a dialysis or a CKD, ESRD nut. You know, I really feel like this is such important information. Up oh, and there, so I'm looking at my name and phone number right there. Um, just such important information that people know, and, 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 and even for people on the phone. So when people come and they get education from me, a lot of times they'll bring family members or friends, neighbors, whatever, and I actually focus on those people and say, look, you, you have no idea. You may have kidney disease, so I strongly encourage you, next time you know, you're know you getting a physical, tell your doctor you want your kidney function tested because there are ways to slow down the progression of kidney disease, in particular eating fresh. Not a lot of that processed, quick foods that we eat. Stay away from all that salt and all, all the additives. I mean, that's all hard on the kidney. And then ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, those anti-inflammatory medications. I have met many people that they don't have high blood pressure, they don't have uh, diabetes, but because of uh, anti-inflammatory medications, they're actually on dialysis. And you know, you think you buy something at the dollar store, how harmful can it be? Well, it can be plenty harmful. So with that, I guess if everybody or anybody is still on here, because I can't tell, um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer any of those. But like I said, please, um, you know, jot down my number. Um, so I, I am um, I'm one of the ambassadors with DPC. I've been with DPC for, for several years as well. Um, but just if there's anything, any questions or anything I can do for anybody at all, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and that's it for me. Hello. So there's a, a couple questions oh. that have come in uh, through the chat. Um, so uh, one of them is, uh, do they still need to add insulin to bags if needed for diabetics? So we usually, we have not done that in years, actually. So the, the more the more of the focus is getting your blood pressure under control by you using those medications and the diet. 
right? So we have awesome dietitians that can help with all of that, um, but we've not put insulin. I mean, gosh, I can't. I mean, so I can remember us doing it, but it's been years since we've done that. Another question that came in is. Um, is a person with previous stomach surgery, so a hysterectomy, qualify for CAPD? What risk is involved? Awesome. So I have an awesome story about that if we have time for this. So I have a, a young lady <clears throat> that she had a nephrectomy, a C two C-sections. She had a tummy tuck. She had a bowel resection. She had her gallbladder removed. Oh, wow, she had something else. So of course her nephrologist said, too many surgeries, it's not going to happen, so she never pursued it. I say go to a surgeon and let them tell you if you are a candidate or not. I took this young lady to this awesome surgeon in Philly. Um, he consulted. He said, I think I could do that. I think there's plenty of space in there. A week later, he popped that catheter in, and she's been doing home dialysis. She's been doing PD now since last Christmas and is happy as a lark. So I say... You know, I love the nephrologists I work with, but they are not surgeons, and they do not do PD catheter placement. So please go to a surgeon that does PD catheter placement and be consulted with that, with that particular surgeon. Uh, someone asked what surgeon. Uh, do they live in Philly? <laughs> So you're going to go. You're going to go to a. You want to make sure that you find a surgeon that does PD catheter placement, right? You can ask your home nurses who they usually use, or you can ask uh, nephrologists who they use. So for us, actually in Delaware, in Delaware we have our one of our transplant surgeons does PD catheter placement, but we have some just awesome general surgeons. Um, uh, you can do a lot of times. Um, a GI doc, so GI surgeon, surgeons that do, uh, you know, like gastric bypass, you know, bariatric surgeons, you know, they're awesome. They are awesome. They know the anatomy and, and they know what they're looking for. They know about scar tissue. Um, you know, they, they, they know how much space is available. So, yeah, so if you, if you don't have any other um, uh, choices, that bariatric is always a good, good, good surgeon. But if, if you're in Philly, it's Dr. Wernstein at Penn Medicine. <laughs> he's, he's awesome. He is the very best surgeon. So. so there were a series of questions that came in. And if you need to follow up with this person later, just uh, let me know. But they are, uh, what are the benefits of preemptive uh, kidney transplant? Uh, what are the survival benefits um, to transplant over hemo and PD? And um, the living uh, donation benefits over a deceased donor. Okay, so I'm going to go backwards, right? So living donor versus deceased donor. So, so what you want to think about with living donor, and I tell people, you know, you want somebody similar in your age. If you get a living donor that's 20 years older than you, that kidney's not going to function as long as it would if you got someone your own age, right? So you want someone your own age because you want that kidney to function as long as you're alive, right? So the guy I gave a kidney to, he's very close to my age. Um, so, you know, we should kind of be along the same line. So his kidney should continue to fun function the rest of his life. Um, deceased donor, uh, sometimes uh, deceased donors have had, you know, different comorbids. There's maybe some unknowns with their, their health, um, you know, so anything that might have affected the kidney, um, certainly would, you know, make it not as, um, uh, I don't know what I want to say, so, you know, the, the, the likelihood of it lasting as long, right? So with a living donor that you know, so a living donor has to go through this same evaluation process that you have to, right? So you know they have a good heart, you know they have good vascular system, you know there's no cancer. You know, there, so there, there's a lot of evaluation process with a living donor versus the deceased donor. So there's a lot of unknown with the deceased. Um, as far as preemptive um, transplant before dialysis, boy, that is my goal in life. I'll tell you, I, uh, if I can ever make that happen, and, and it's happened several times, that, it, that makes my whole job worth it. So um, what you want to remember is that dialysis, definitely uh, can replace your kidney function, but not totally, right? So for even good dialysis, you're probably getting like a GFR, we talked about, you know, your percentage of kidney function, probably anywhere between 15 to 
when you get a when you get a kidney transplant, you're you're squared on up, right? So you're about sixty percent at least. Um, you know, and and your body has not gone through uh, any kind of foreign like like I talked about the synthetic dialyzer or even the solutions, right? With peritoneal dialysis, your body has not been exposed to anything foreign. Right, you you know you you get that kidney transplant and and you know that's what we that's why we consider it the golden option. So you know it, it kind of keeps you as healthy, right? Or if not healthier, certainly then on dialysis. Another person asked, what are the limits if there is an age difference? So say if you're 51 and the donor is 65. Oh nope. So that's that's you know what? So you really just want to look at health wise. If, if you have somebody 65 and is a living donor and wants to donate a kidney to you and, and there, you have no, you know, so no one younger is, is offering, I would scoop that bad boy right up. You know, because living donation, you, like I said, living donation, so this, this person's going to have to go through this whole total evaluation just like you, and you're going to know, right? So you're going to know, you know, is there mild hypertension? Is there, you know, certainly not diabetes because they would not be a candidate, but um, definitely. So that's not 15 years is not that big of a deal. I'm I'm talking like a lot of you know. So a lot of times grandparents or what you know want to give to the, the grandchild. That's kind of too much. Um, but even at that, you know, it's still going to buy you some good quality time off of dialysis. You might eventually need to have another transplant. But if you can get a living donor similar age, that's the best. But a living donor period is is a real good option. Well, Joanne, thank you for sharing all of your um, I know, only a little thimble of your knowledge with us, but you shared a lot of information and your passion and your enthusiasm for what you do shines through throughout your presentation. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, are there any last any last um, questions, or anyone who's only on the phone have a question? We've got time for maybe one more. All right. Well, um, again, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, the recording and the slides will be available um, on our website, and Hillary will be sending you information about that. And um, lastly, I encourage everyone to remember to complete the feedback form that's at the end. And please join us next month on December 17th. We'll be uh, having a, a webinar on holiday hints with a dietitian who talks about diet mistakes people make around the holidays. And um, so please join us then. Please register for the, the webinar. And Joanne, thank you again. We hope you will join us again. I will. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.